Okay, I'm not an expert in acquisition, um, but I know something about the thing that's changing it, and that's this digital revolution. And I'd like to, uh, uh, if, if you'll bear with me, to stand back a bit and look at some of the bigger contextual changes that are happening overall in the world, and in particular with the transformation of government. I think that whenever you think about something that might be possible, and you start to hear all the objections to doing that, I always like to put these objections in one of two categories. Are they reasons to not do this? Or are they what you might call implementation challenges that you might actually be able, able to, to overcome? And I just tell you, I've been at this 35 years now, most of the really big ideas that I've run across over the years that everyone's objected to uh, were not bad ideas. They had implementation challenges, and many people rejected them. Now, one of the things that got rejected was a lot of the ideas about reinventing government, not about putting government online or websites or any of that, but changes to a number of things. First, to the deep structure and architecture of government, and really how we orchestrate capability in society to innovate, to create public services. Al Gore was on this. And you know what you like about Al Gore? He was on this reinventing of government thing. Um, our program, 1999, laid it out. Here are the things that we need to do to make fundamental changes to the architecture of government. It's really a new division of labor and society about how we create public value and also changes to the nature of governance, the nature of democracy. Well, we have a burning platform today, and there is nothing so powerful as an idea of this time has come. We have to do this. And the reason is that the irresistible force of the, the pressures to control the cost of government are meeting up with the immovable expectations uh, the movable object, if you like, of the public expectations about what government should be, which is government should be better. We should be safer. There should be better health care. There should be um, better uh, uh, capability. We need to have more prosperity. <coughs> government's got a role in doing that. So I think tinkering with this situation is not going to be the solution. We need to make fundamental change. And the reason I'm here is I think procurement and acquisition may turn out to be the lever to break the whole thing open and to bring about the kind of change that I've been arguing for uh, for quite a while. You look around today and you see a whole set of institutions that are in various stages of being stalled or frozen or in atrophy or even failing, contrasted with something new. What you can see, for every one of these, you can see the contours of a set of sparkling new initiatives that show how this industry could be done in a very different way. You know, the Industrial Age Corporation was typified by General Motors, America's greatest company, that went bankrupt. Uh, I've talked to you about the financial system. Newspapers, the problem that newspapers solved is no longer a problem. As one youngster said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. So, um, so, I guarantee, you know, a decade from now, your newspaper is not going to be delivered to your doorstep or your hotel room or something like that. Twitter is my newspaper. I have my economics people, my political people, and my sports people. I try and follow points of view I don't agree with, too, because one of the things I'm trying to avoid is this so-called balkanization, where we all end up just following our own points of view and you end up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where the purpose of information is maybe not to inform you, but to, uh, I don't know, give you comfort. So for every one of these, you can see the new model emerging, but it's going to be tough. I mean, newspaper is a good example. How do, how do we get there? How do we ensure quality? How do we protect investigative reporting? How do we uh, pay journalists? All of these are an industrial model, where something at the top has power and it pushes out something to passive recipients. We push out products. We have mass production. We have mass media. We push out newspapers and magazines and radio shows and television. We, we have uh, mass education. We, we push out lectures, right? 
one to many, one size fits all, it's focused on me, the teacher, and everyone in the audience is a passive recipient. I'm a teacher of knowledge, you're a student, you don't get ready, here it comes. I mean, the lecture is the very best model of technology that like fifth century, uh, or a uh, 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 very best model of learning that fifth century technology can provide. <laughs> what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk to you about two of these, about uh, government and about democracy. Now, why, is, why are these changes happening? Well, let's just do a little context here. First of all, there are four big drivers for change, for sure. What, leading to the fact that this is finally happened, the time is now for us to do this. The first is the technology revolution. And you know lots about this, so I'm gonna be really brief. We have the social web, um, and it's not just that there are a billion point two people. Facebook had a couple of weeks ago its uh, 10th anniversary. I was actually there at the campus uh, at the time. And uh, this continues to grow. Um, and there's crazy stuff around this. WhatsApp got sold for $17 billion. That zero revenue. I mean, it's, that kind of sounds dot com -y to me. But uh, <laughs> anyway, setting aside that, this is the real deal. We now have close to a billion and a half people using social media. And in the next 10 years, that will go to uh, upwards of 6 billion people. So we're all collaborating now in all kinds of new ways. Secondly, we have mobility. It's hard to imagine the importance of being connected all the time. This has happened so fast. I was just thinking back a decade ago, we were doing these big programs. People didn't use mobile devices to access anything except telephony. Well, now that's all changing fundamentally. And in some ways that are extraordinary, I'll just give you an example. I was in a safari. Um, in Kenya, in the in Samburu land, and we met a 14-year-old goat herder, and she didn't have water, I mean, she drank goat's milk, she didn't have electrical power, but she did have a little solar charger to power her mobile device that could pull up a browser. So she has access to the internet. Now, uh, sh she's also pregnant with her second child, She's married to a 65-year-old who, uh, we were told, paid 170 goats for her. He's distrustful of this thing that she's got. Talk about the cognitive dissonance for her. She can see what Hillary Clinton has to say about you know, women's rights and stuff like that. But, um, but, but this is all moving forward. It's going to be terribly disruptive, but it's shaking up things big time. I think one of the biggest changes related to mobility is the rise of geospatiality. You know, on the old web, you surf websites. In the new web, you surf physical reality. So has anyone tried Google goggles uh, here? It's, it's worth a try. And uh, it's pretty shocking, actually, to be able to be walking around and ask a question and get the answer in your glasses. It raises all kinds of pretty amazing issues, not just for the education system, but for all of us. I mean, I never had to think about what should I keep on board and what should I keep off board. I just tried to stuff my head with everything that I could, I could learn, including dates and all kinds of things. Do we need to know uh, the date of the Declaration of Independence? I think we probably do, actually. But there are some dates that we don't need to know. So um, fascinating things. But I can go outside here with, with goggle, uh, goggles or with layer. And, I, and, and I'll point at this building, say, this is where the IBM you know, Center for uh, uh, e-government is, and so on. What do you want to know? Well, I want to know what they do, and what are their programs, and so on. Or I'm looking for an ATM or a men's shoe store. Oh, there's one just uh, uh, around the corner. This is the intersection of the physical and digital world. Now, the next one is, is uh, big data. Of course, there's lots of, 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 of talk about this, uh, <laughs> the great app. Affirmism uh, came from Eric Schmidt, the erstwhile CEO of Google. He says, between the year, between the beginning of humanity and the year 2003, we recorded five exabytes of information. That's a lot. An exabyte is a quintillion bytes. He says, in the last 18 hours, we recorded five exabytes of information. Now, a lot of that is cat videos. 
But, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is like financial transactions, like really important stuff. And a lot of it is, is social activity that can now be uh, captured. Now, there's some huge privacy issues, obviously, with this. But the big thing for me is that big data is becoming social data. It's now collected socially from this myriad of activity that's going on with soon billions of people and soon trillions of inert objects in the world that become smart communicating devices. We analyze it socially rather than having someone in a back room with a green eye shade, okay, exaggeration, uh, you know, looking at these arcane financial models and so on. It's driven out down so everybody has access to these tools, including on the mobile device. It becomes much more visual and it becomes real time. So stuff like SAP's HANA would be an example of a real-time sort of system where you're acquiring this. Then we have the industrial internet, or so-called M2M computing, the physical world becoming smart and communicating. That was, uh, John Chambers is saying a trillion devices in five years. A trillion devices, computers, um, What does that mean? What does that mean for when all this stuff is smart and communicating. I have a friend in Toronto, everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address, and all these things talk to each other. I have no idea what his toaster says to his refrigerator, but uh, he was actually bragging that his fence talks to the sprinkler system. And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of <laughs> so, pervasive IBM <coughs> computing and we're printing food and we're now printing houses and uh, what does that mean for the construction industry and employment there but we've got to do it we've got to march forward and we have to address these bigger social issues and finally the cloud you know Thomas Watson was famously to have said the world will only need five computers. Remember that? And then everyone made fun of him for like six decades. I think he was pretty close, wasn't he? He had the IBM computer, the Amazon computer, the Google <laughs> computer. I mean, if you think of the internet as a computer, you know, the old web was a platform for the presentation of content. The new web is a platform for computation. Every time you go onto the web, and you upload something on the uh, vines or Instagram or you remix some music or even you do a, a search, you're programming this global computer. Humanity is building a machine together and that enables some spectacular things. Now one of the things that enables over time, we're going to move IT that was in our organizations onto this big computer. And the reason to do that is and the analogy with the power grid is not bad. The people used to have the, their own power plants and companies. Now, it, it's a limited analogy because everything that runs through a power line is fungible and, and, and it's all commodity. What runs through a computer network is, the, is data. Data is the most variable thing in the world. A piece of data can be a, a part of a financial transaction, a picture of your daughter. But, um, the reason to move to this new computer is that it's going to be cheaper, uh, you get better integration, the most important thing is the world becomes your software development department. Now easier said than done, of course, and all of you live with that, because all of you have this little detail called the legacy. You know, the irresistible force of this new paradigm meets up with the immovable object of a uh, $4 trillion installed base of heavy metal. And uh, I know some of the systems you have are old enough to vote and drink. <laughs> Probably old enough to retire. <laughs> so that's point number one. We do have a new paradigm in technology. That, that's a technology driver. Now we also have a demand pull from a new generation of young people. And a couple of you alluded to that earlier. I started studying kids about 20 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. At first I thought my children are prodigies. And, uh, but then I noticed all their friends were like them. So that was a bad theory. 
So uh, I started working with 300 kids and I wrote this book in 97. I said, these kids are going to have no fear of technology because it won't be there. It's, it's like the air for them. Just, just like I have no fear of a refrigerator because I don't view it as being technology. Well, flash forward to today, they're not just growing up, they've grown up. They're now coming into the public sector uh, as employees. They're, they're becoming citizens, they're consumers. Uh, the biggest wave right now is in post-secondary education, but the, the, the advanced wave is now into the workforce. <coughs> and uh, there's no more powerful force to change every institution than the first generation of digital natives. Um, I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. So just some demographics on this. Uh, people talk about the aging of the population. I'm not sure that's a great term, because the population is bifurcating. Because this generation is huge. And around the world, they're the biggest generation ever. They're the children of the baby boom. The baby boom echo. But in the United States, there's 78.5 million baby boomers. There are 80 million echo boomers. So, um, and I'd be happy to, to talk about this. I'm going to try and get through the presentation so we can have a discussion. But we did a $4 million research project. We interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries. And we know a lot about this generation. Um, based on their demographic muscle alone, they're going to dominate um, everything, pretty much the, the next period, the next number of decades. Now, what makes them a force for change, and I dub them the net generation, people calling them the Gen Y and millennials and so on, but I thought, you know, what's the defining characteristic of the generation? It's that they're the first to grow up digital. <laughs> These kids are actually different. In their cultures, the new culture of work, I think there's a new model of acquisition. Um, there's a new citizen. There's the new consumer. And uh, I, don't, I don't have time to go through this, but I'll just give you a couple examples. It's a woman named Rahaf Harfouche. Um, I know her quite well. Uh, she's one of my daughter's best friends. And she, uh, she's doing a book launch of her new book tomorrow night. But uh, uh, I asked her, your generation, do you use email? And she says, oh, no, Mr. Top Scott, that's like yesterday's technology. I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, Email's sort of like a formal technology, say for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That <laughs> <laughs> email. Um, Sherry Kong, a uh, 20-year-old student from New Zealand, hired by the government along with 80 other students. Their job, to teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. Uh, I asked her, Sherry, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Tapska, teachers like they're awful. Students. They talk in class, they don't do their homework. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on the right there is the granddaddy of them all. That's uh, Michael Perry. He was 28 at the time. He's now 32. Um, I guess he was 27 at the time. Uh, this is the World Congress at IT in Austin. It was a big crowd, like 7,000 people in the audience. And uh, out of the mouths of babes, it was the highest rated session. And um, I've known Michael actually since. He was 13 years old because he was the project manager on my website, growingupdigital.com. And they made him the project manager because he was the oldest, the most experienced uh, developer on the team as a 13-year-old. And um, when he was 15, he sold his own website for an undisclosed seven or eight-figure US dollar sum. One of the news reports said it was probably only a million dollars. And I sent him an email. I said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars. You should have called me. And he wrote back and he said, Don, legally, I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can tell you, I'm very happy. <laughs> and um, he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari. He wanted to, well, invest in his next new venture. It's called takingitglobal.org. This is 400,000 young people in a network that want to change the world. So the whole negative thing, again, I'd be happy to go into that about young people. They're net addicted to the, the screen. They're the dumbest generation is the title of the book, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. Uh, Dean, uh, Dean Twain gave a book called Generation. He says, we create a little army of narcissists. Um, they're, they're, they're into risky youth culture that's sexist, and, and uh, they're a bunch of little criminals. And uh, you know, all, I mean, oh, they're bullies. 
Actually, half of them are bullies, and the other half are being bullied. Um, there's no data to support any of this. They're the smartest generation. Um, by all of our measures of smartness, they're, um, they don't give a damn. Youth volunteering in America has been growing year over year for like 17, 18 years now, both high school and in university. Um, they're, they're the criminal, actually, youth crime has been dropping for over 15 years in the US. Ah, the drugs and alcohol and all the rest. Well, um, the percent of kids in high school in the United States that are clean, that don't do either alcohol or drugs, has been growing year over year for a decade. So, and from my research, they've got very strong values. Now, there are a bunch of big issues. We told them, you work hard, you stay out of trouble, you graduate, you can have a successful and prosperous life. Well, increasingly, all around the world, uh, at least in OECD countries, the 34 developed countries in the world, that's proving to not be true. So there's a lot to talk about the lost generation and so on. We'll come back to that. But these are the eight norms of the generation. They exist across the 11 countries that we, sorry, the 10 countries that we study. And if you're designing a school or a government or a corporation or a marketing system, these are the norms. And I'll, I'll just say what they are, and we can talk if you want. Uh, freedom, they, freedom of everything. Freedom of mobility, freedom of choice. Choices like oxygen. I had three media choices when I was a kid. Today, they have millions, right? They want to customize everything. I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club. When I was a kid. These kids didn't <laughs> change their world. The generation of scrutinizers. When I was a kid, I saw a picture. It was a picture. These kids look at a picture. What is it? An animation, a bottom, more. If I look at the cover of Vogue, I see a model. My daughter sees a Photoshop job, but her neck is longer and her cheekbones are bigger and so on. They're a generation with very strong values. We can be very hopeful. I grew up watching TV, being the passive recipient of somebody else's video. They've grown up interacting. The main thing that time online has taken away from is being a passive recipient watch your television. It's not taken away from hanging out with your friends and talking to your parents and learning the piano or doing your homework or, or any of that. It's taken away from TV. But they are a generation who wants to have fun. And not fun like, yeah, big party time. They think that, uh, well, I'll give you an example. We ask them, when you're online, what are you doing? Are you working, learning, collaborating, or having fun? And they all, all around the world, they had trouble answering that question. Like, those are the same thing. Work, learning, collaborating, having fun, aren't they? When I was watching Mickey Mouse, I was only doing one of those things. Now, having fun. Mm -hmm. I think the kids have got it right. In their culture is the new culture of work. What are we doing today? Are we working or learning? It's called knowledge work. It's the same thing. Increasingly, we work through collaborative models, and I hope you're having fun. I mean, I try and make my it's fun because I find that people learn more when they're conscious. <laughs> but, uh, oh, a need for immediate gratification. Well, is that what it is? They want things to happen fast. You know, my daughter, when she first graduated from university, she was working for a consulting company. She flew from Toronto to Minneapolis every week. She could check into the Marriott Hotel in 30 seconds. She used to time herself. And they always could check her in at 30 seconds. And she wonders, why does it take my government 30 days to do something that's about equally complicated? Does she have a need for immediate gratification? Or does she have legitimate expectations that the metabolism of our public service ought to be faster? And they're a generation of innovators. So, so that's a huge force. Now you put those two together, I'm going to speed this up a bit, um, and you get this social revolution. Now, I'm a Canadian, okay? this is not a political statement, I don't even vote, it's a, it's a social media story. But the uh, Obama campaign, MyBarackObama.com, the first time around, was really material in him becoming elected. The way I discovered that somebody sent me an email saying, you know the senator from, the, from Illinois thinks your book is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America? You should go to MyBarackObama.com. So I go there, and there, one down from the home page, is my book, Economic. And, and it says, 
we believe in the power of the internet and the, uh, the, uh, the self-organizing and the inclusiveness and the, the book, Wikonomics, by Don Topscott and saying, I'm asking you to believe not this is my ability to bring about real change in Washington. I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I looked at this thing and well, my first reaction was, I am the man. <laughs> <laughs> but not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man. Because um, I had a look around. There's a Wikonomics community. There's young firefighters for Obama community. And there's a, a, uh, a single mom's daycare for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized. And every one of them had a funding target. This thing, this is the first time I took a picture of it. No money had been raised, and with a $5,000 goal, pretty soon they raised the $5,000 goal. Uh, they raised the money, whoever these people were, I didn't even participate in it. And then they increased the goal to 10, and then they increased it to 25, and, 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 and so on. So this is a revolutionary force. Now, I use the word revolution advisedly, because there's a revolution in revolution that's underway today. Now, there was a big debate about the role of social media and social change. Remember, Malcolm Gladwell said the revolution will not be tweeted, and I got involved in the debate, and then it got settled by one word, Tunisia. And then there was another word, Bahrain, another word, Libya, another word, Egypt, and another, on and on it went. Now, the social media didn't cause the Tunisian revolution, it was caused by injustice. Um, Social media didn't create the Tunisian revolution. It was created by a new generation of young people who wanted hope and who didn't want to be treated as subjects anymore and wanted jobs. But the media was really key in ways that people don't know about. You know, during the Tunisian revolution, snipers associated with the old regime was killing unarmed students in the streets, protesting. So the kids would take their mobile device, take a picture of the location of the sniper, triangulate it, send that to friendly military units um, who, would, sorry, uh, who would come in and who would, uh, who would take out the snipers. So you think that social media is about hooking up online for these kids it was a tool for self-defense. In Syria, before things fell apart, uh, protesters in the street would get injured, you get picked up by an ambulance, you get taken to a hospital, you go in with a broken leg, and you come out with a bullet in your head. Assad was using the regime to kill, um, the, using the healthcare system to kill uh, opponents. So two youngsters created an alternative healthcare system on Twitter, and when you got injured, tweets went out, uh, you got picked up by a vehicle, taken to a makeshift medical clinic, where you got medical attention being killed. Now I know when you look at this you think, well where is all this going? And it's disturbing. You know, these, these wiki revolutions, they leave a they happen so fast they leave a vacuum and politics abhors a vacuum and the danger of course is a vacuum filled by fundamentalist forces and by, you know, the old uh, 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 dictators or tyrannical regimes. But overall I think the arc of history is a positive and that this is moving forward. Democracy is never an easy thing, and the train has left the station. The cat is out of the bag. The horse is out of the box. <laughs> Help me out here. The uh, <laughs> toothpaste is out of the tooth. This is going forward. Now, the concern here, I'll get to Kermit right after this, is that we need to fix some of these problems. These are protests in the world. 15 years ago, there were 6,000 measurable protests. Last year, there were 280,000. So we need to find a way as societies to address these big problems and to create the conditions whereby young people have an opportunity uh, to be successful. OK, so you put those together, and you get an economic revolution. This is really important to thinking about the future of government. You know, the 20th anniversary edition of the Digital Economy comes out this year. And in that book, I, uh, there was the first bestseller about the internet. In that book, I argued that the key to understanding the internet are the theories of an economist named Ronald Coase. And he never wrote about the internet, but I still 
hold today that Coe's is the key economist. Um, 75 years ago, he wrote a paper where he asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? He, he, he said, if Adam Smith is right, and the open market is the best mechanism to understand why how goods and resources and people and information should be allocated in an economy, why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? And he said the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying this, the answer is transaction costs. The cost of search, he said this 75 years ago, the cost of search in an open market, of finding all the right information or people to do something, is totally prohibitive. So we bring that inside the boundaries of a corporation where we have things like org charts to find people and, and filing cabinets to find information and so on. Well, the big industrialists understood this. And Henry Ford had within the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company, power plant, steel mill, shipping company, glass factory. Why? Because the cost of transactions in an open market were greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the corporation. So the procurement function, obviously, was a function inside the boundaries of the organization to acquire goods and services from outside and bring them in. Well, paradigm shift, we argued, well, no. I mean, the boundaries of the corporation are becoming more porous. And uh, back then, we called it the extended enterprise. Then, you know, in the late 90s, we saw the rise of the business web, the business ecosystem where vertically integrated companies began to unbundle into networks. And now, transaction costs are dropping so much that peers can come together and create value. You know, we've always created value by superiors and subordinates in supply chains, within organizations. You're either, you're one or the other, or you alternate between them. If you can create an encyclopedia with a couple of million people, and it's, uh, 20 times bigger than Britannica in 240 languages, but according to the big study that's been done, the quality is about the same. What else could you create? Could you create a computer operating system through peer production? Well, Linux is now the dominant operating system in the world. Could you create a physical thing like a motorcycle? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry is dozens of little companies they cooperate together, they meet on the internet and in tea houses, there's no OEM. There's no Harley Davidson pulling all the strings. There's no company. This is now 40% of global motorcycle production to get ready for the $1,000 car from China using the same model. So, I think you may know where I'm going with this, that the corporation the industrial age corporation grew up at the same time as the industrial age government, the government bureaucracy. And we created bureaucracies because that was the hot new management concept 85 years ago. It wasn't a pejorative term. And we needed bureaucracies. We needed to have structures. We need to control the public person to prevent graft and patronage and, and, and corruption and be able to track what was going on and so on. Well, just like the corporation is changing, so are governments. So you know the Bernie platform idea, that you're somewhere where the costs of staying where you are become much greater than the cost <coughs> of moving to something new. When you think about procurement and the whole supply chain, aren't we moving more towards these business ecosystems? Rather than a chain, it's a network. Rather than a serial thing, you know, we put in a, an RFP and all you people bid on it, and then we select the best one, and so on, that it becomes much more real-time and collaborative thing. Um, that becomes much more dynamic, and it's something that is, it's resilient. It's like a, a system, uh, rather than a chain that's constantly changing. So um, I'm going to just skip ahead here. This is all good stuff. But let's, let's get into applying this to the government itself. So just to make the point very clear, this was the model of the industrial age corporation. It was the model of government. Now, hierarchies are not going to go away. But what happened is over the years, we brought IT into our enterprises and also into governments. And we use technology to code 
and, and to uh, solidify old business processes. And now we, we have this situation where when you make investments, often it's a struggle to make sure that they contribute to a desired future as opposed to just building up the legacy. So just like in the private sector, we're moving away from vertically integrated corporations to business web. This is an 11 year old diagram. So in the public sector, we can move towards networks. And when people talk about open government, I think they confuse it a lot. Um, so to me, open government has a number of elements. There's the one that people think of most often, which is about transparency. And that's a good idea. We want governments to be open in the sense of transparent. All around the world, government corruption is a massive problem. And sunlight is the best disinfectant. So um, we need to make governments naked, if you like. Because when you're naked, there's some crawlers that go along with that. One is that fitness is no longer optional. You know, as we've been saying, if you're going to be naked, you better be buff. And the way to get governments to be buff is to get them naked and let sunlight clean them up. But to me, that's not the biggest opportunity or the most important meaning of openness. A much bigger opportunity is about open data. And the term here, you know the term, government as a platform, right? That government, by releasing raw data, of course with appropriate privacy and security considerations, you release raw data, and then you create a platform whereby the civil society, private companies, other government agencies, academics, foundations, individuals, whatever, can self-organize to create public value, or what we used to call services. Okay. So I'll just give you a trivial uh, example that helps people um, understand this. I was with the CEO of Melbourne. Melbourne has a CEO. And we were talking about this and I said, I said to her, give me an example of some data that you have in Melbourne about anything that, that you're not releasing. And she said, well, why don't just talk to the chief of police? We have some data about bicycle accidents. I'd say, great, just publish it. Within 48 hours, someone will do a Google map mashup and showing where it's dangerous to go on your bicycle in Melbourne, you'll be saving lives in a week. It costs you nothing. So this is about, this is not about putting government online or any of that. It's a new division of labor in society about how we create public value. We have industrial age models of government and democracy, and we need to move to new models <coughs> for an age of network intelligence. Yeah, I don't like the term information age. I don't think this is an information age. It's an age whereby we're connecting human cranium. It's an age of collaboration, and it's an age of participation. Well, when you get a new paradigm, and I guess that's what you're talking about today, you get a leadership crisis. Because new paradigms cause dislocation and conflict. We're nearly always received with cruelness or worse, I'm guessing, knowing listening to you going around the table here, that everyone in this room knows what it's like to be received with coolness when you introduce a new idea. <coughs> Vested interests fight against change. And leaders of old paradigms have the greatest difficulty embracing the new. How are we going to find leadership for change? Well, it's your opportunity. You know, leadership typically doesn't come from the top. It can't. But the person at the top can't learn for an organization as a whole anymore. Things are getting too complicated. Leadership can come from anywhere. What does an age of network intelligence look like? And how could that affect the government? I've, been, I've studied thousands of organizations. Recently, I've been studying nature, trying to understand uh, what we can learn from nature. And fish come in schools. Bees come in uh, swarms. And starlings over the moors of England come at something called a murmuration. Have you heard that term? Murmuration. It refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And at night, the starlings are out over a 20-mile radius sort of doing their starling thing. And um, 
uh, during the day, and at night they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in nature. Um, scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And the murmuration has a function. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead. Um, it gives the birds uh, uh, a whole social structure, but it also protects the birds from predators. In some of these pictures, you can see a hawk, a fearsome predator, being chased away by the collective power of the little birds. And um, there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, is this some kind of fanciful analogy, or could we actually learn something from this? Well, this thing, I think, functions according to the principles of the network world that I've been describing to you. It's a big collaboration. There's an openness, all kinds of sharing of information about not just danger or uh, food sources, so on, but also uh, sharing information about uh, trajectory, speed, danger. There are rules. The, the underlying one being uh, don't bump into somebody else. Um, there's a sort of interdependence. And I say to business audiences, business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And these, this thing functions as if the interest of the individual bird is somehow connected to the interest of the murmuration as a whole. And it has a great sort of integrity that somehow um, gives the birds great courage to take on a fearsome credit. So I look at this and I get a lot of hope. I mean, imagine if we could connect ourselves on this planet as citizens and its institutions with some kind of vast network of glass and air. Could we go beyond just sharing information to start to share our intelligence? Could we create some kind of collective intelligence that maybe goes beyond a you know, a team or a department or an institution or a society? Could we create some kind of consciousness that extends beyond an individual? I don't know. But if we could do that, we could surely do some extraordinary things. 